Welcome back to the Nutramedical Report live for Wednesday. We have Harley Schlanger, lots of issues burning. The latest moves by NATO and by the European Union are very dangerous. We now have the Kiev uh, government, which is basically a coup government, now attacking with weapons, uh, I think nine or ten cities across mainly eastern Ukraine. And Russian hasn't responded dramatically, but they do have Russian troops there. Special Forces, I think this is going to blow up very quickly. Harley, tell us what's happening. Well, the first thing you have to realize is that this has nothing to do with Ukraine. It has everything to do with the collapse of the financial system and a desire to both change the subject and also escape from the effects of the collapse that's coming. You know, one thing that's not covered at all in the American press is that yesterday there was a vote in the European Parliament to establish a new banking regulatory system called the Single Resolution Mechanism and the European Stability Mechanism. Now, all this does is give total control over all of Europe's finances to the large banks. And the legislation includes within it the bailout the idea that they can seize deposits. And they call this freeing Europe from government bailouts. So in other words, you're not going to have the government doing a bailout. You're going to have, you're going to have your own money stolen from your bank. Yeah, now, what I heard was negative interest, actually, is another thing they're talking about. Well, I was just going to get to that, because the bail-in can't possibly work, because as soon as anyone tries it, all the banks go, because people will withdraw their money. But what they also, just to fill out what they have in this new banking law, derivatives and derivative holdings are exempt from bail-in. So it's encouraging people who have money in the bank to go into the highly speculative derivatives markets, because that's where they need the liquidity. That's where they need the cash. Now, the irony is that even as this legislation passed, Mario Draghi, the head of the European Central Bank, is talking about a trillion euros of quantitative easing. That's about $1.2 trillion. So they're basically saying that they're going to do bailouts and bail-ins. And the reason they're saying this is because the banking situation is so far gone. Now, just one example. Between the European Union and the United States, $2.5 billion of aid in the form of loan guarantees was given to Ukraine. That's to cover 30 billion in immediate obligations. So 2.5 billion to cover 30 billion. What that means is that virtually anyone holding Ukrainian debt is facing a complete loss right now. Right. So if you put that together with the fact that the, the Greeks sold some bonds last week and there was immediate euphoria because someone lined up to buy them, but then it immediately fell flat when it became clear they weren't going to get enough money for the bonds they needed. So the situation in Europe is in terrible shape. Now, in the U.S., while Janet Yellen is saying, well, unemployment is still slow to, to be removed and we still have a slow employment picture, the housing bubble has crashed. The last four months, housing sales and new starts have gone down. Uh, industrial manufacturing is continuing to drop. So there's no recovery in the United States. So what is Obama doing? We had this very interesting development where John Brennan, the head of the CIA, on a phony passport and a phony identity, maybe even a disguise, showed up in Kiev last weekend. That's the head of the CIA. And hours after he arrived the government of Ukraine announced they would use force to drive out the pro-Russian demonstrators who took over government buildings in eastern Ukrainian cities. Now, isn't, here's an irony, Dr. Bill. I know this wasn't lost on you, but maybe some other people didn't quite get it. What was it that the Ukrainian revolution was about? It was demonstrators taking over government buildings. And then the government of Ukraine, under Yanukovych, chose not to shoot at the demonstrators or use force against them. Instead, Yanukovych fled under threats from the West. 
Now the West, and by that I mean the European Union, NATO, and the United States, is telling the current government they must use force to clear buildings. Now the problem they have is the Ukrainian military is highly unreliable. And there are reports today that armored vehicles taking Ukrainian soldiers into cities, that the vehicles were seized from the Ukrainian army. Uh, Six armored personnel carriers were taken over by crowds shouting, Russia, Russia. And in some cases, the Ukrainian army people deserted to the demonstrators. Of course they would. They they know that uh, trying to take on Russia is suicidal. And you see, the other thing is, this is not even Russia that's doing this. These are no, no, Ukrainians. no. Russia's, Russia's a victim of it, just like the Ukrainians are. But this is part of their game. It's an end game. Well, but what I'm saying is that the even the Ukrainian people who went to mediate with the so-called militia forces, the pro-Russia militia forces that took over the buildings, said that the people were all Ukrainian. They weren't Russian soldiers. The only line we're getting on Russian soldiers involved there is from that liar, Samantha Powers, and from that liar, Susan Rice, the same person who said that the Benghazi terrorist assault was really just about a a riot against a video. So we're getting lies in our media. Now, what the Russians are doing up to this point is that Putin has a very aggressive... uh, foreign minister who's going around trying to counter John Kerry and and uh, Cameron and Obama's lies. But the Russians are playing it very calm, very cool. Putin will not be provoked. But at some point, if this kind of escalation from the West continues, the Russians will move, and we won't be able to do anything about it unless we're well, ready gonna, to risk nuclear war. If, if uh, Russia doesn't respond, he'll have an internal revolution in Russia because they'll be so enraged by him not taking action. So uh, he's going to be forced to take action probably in the next 20 to 30 days. I would well, I think, by then. I'm saying I think he will, if this continues, he will take action. Now, what oh, the Russians to, are trying to do it's, it's is going to use continue. a hearing in Geneva tomorrow. Right. Uh, four power Ukraine, EU, U.S., and Russia <laughs> to make their points. But look, the, the point is, whatever the Russians do, the initiative on this has come from Obama and from NATO. We're right. putting 10,000 combat troops into Poland. Has Russia threatened Poland? We're putting F-16s into Latvia. Are the Russians threatening Latvia? Uh, we're putting the USS Donald Cook into the <clears throat> Romanian Black Sea port. The USS Donald Cook has anti-ballistic missile <clears throat> defense capabilities. So what we're seeing is an escalation from the western side, from Obama, driven right. by this financial collapse. And it's very dangerous. Yeah, well, and what he's threatening is a posture of World War Three, not just a regional war. And he's yeah, uh, threat- exactly. and, and he said, and he's basically telling the Russians and the message to them, "We're prepared to go to World War Three. We don't want to even just contain this as a regional conflict or resolve it at the table. We're going to put our weapon systems in a forward position, as if we're fighting a final conflict." And the Russians are basically saying, <clears throat> "Don't push this." Because right. we will respond, but let's talk. And Obama's saying, okay, let's talk. You do everything we say. Well, that's the way Obama works. I mean, even when he's in his own party. If you agree with him, that's he's right. very agreeable. And if you don't agree with him, he's a monster. That's what's wrong that's with his, Obama. That's his, re- that's his response to Congress also. Oh, yeah. Well, even with his own party, the people inside the Democratic Party will tell you straight up that, uh, that Obama dealing with him is impossible. Because he's such a narcissist, he's always the smartest man in the room, even if he's a moron. He basically says, you know, it's my way or the highway. Yeah. Welcome back, and uh, Harley. These, these four topics you talk about Rio Novosti, the uh, report with uh, Lyndon LaRouche, uh, the other reports with Helga, uh, his wife. Um, <clears throat> I think that we're basically at the point now, if we don't start the impeachment process on Obama, we're probably going to be into a fairly significant war by the summer. And literally, Russia is being dragged, screaming into this, saying, please do not proceed because we we'd ha- we cannot not respond. And the Russians don't want to do this, but we're literally dragging them in, screaming to not do this. Well, I think your analysis is absolutely right. 
the Russians don't want a war. The Russians tried to avoid this by offering aid to Ukraine, because they knew Ukraine was a basket case, and the European Union was offering them nothing. I mean, put yourself in the position of a, a person living in Crimea. You see the Medvedev comes in, the Russian prime minister, and he says, we're going to give you Russian pensions, which is twice what they're getting in Ukraine right now. And he said, we're going to make sure you get cheap oil and gas. We're going to help subsidize your health system. And that's what you get if you join with Russia. Now, at the same time, they were told, if you stay with Ukraine, you're going to get the International Monetary Fund policy, a 50% cut in your existing pensions, which would put them at the level of, of 25% of the Russian pensions. You right. know, Russian pensions aren't that good, but in Ukraine, you starve to death on these pension cuts. Right. Uh, so in other words, there's a difference between that. in gas and oil prices. Wow. So the difference really is we can do a, a very nice nail job and trim your nails to the bone, which will hurt, but you'll grow your nails back, which is a Russian plan. Uh, or we can do an amputation, which is the European Union plan. Well, I think actually what the Russians are saying is that we'll sweeten it by giving you things now. In return, what we really want is for you to join with Eurasia, in, because they want the heavy industry in Ukraine to build trains, <clears throat> high-speed rail, to build pumping stations for water and, and oil. They want to use the Ukrainian land as the base. Land bridge, the is it? It's a land bridge for the for these Silk Trail. It's the old Silk Trail, so yeah. it would make total so, sense that in fact their their rail industry in Ukraine could build all these large Asian Eurasian type trains that would connect all the way through to to uh, Beijing, China, and the other Asian republics across uh, Azerbaijan, Tajikistan, etc. And it would uh, basically and make then from it, there to uh, Germany, right. <clears throat> because the, the head of the German railway was going to meet with Vladimir Yakunin, the head of Russian railways. Only Yakunin is now on sanctions, so he can't leave Russia. He can't go to Germany to have talks with his counterparts, where they have several tens of billions of dollars worth of long-term deals. So the Germans are now starting to say, what is our benefit of sticking with the European Union and Obama? We might have a nuclear war. We might just have a very large and, and devastating land war. <clears throat> uh, and if we don't go to war, we're going to lose all our contracts with the East. So the Germans, there's, there's a growing opposition in Germany to going along with the West. Now, there's right. enormous pressure being put on Germany from Obama and from the Poles. Now, Poland is touted as the great recovery story of Eastern Europe because they've been given huge amounts of loans. And the Polish recovery will collapse if those loans aren't continued. So in return for those loans, the Poles are the leading voice in Eastern Europe for an expansion of NATO eastward. Now, here's the other thing that people should just realize. For those people who think Putin's the enemy, look, let's say Putin's the worst guy in the world. Let me tell you something. Ronald Reagan signed a deal with the Russians that after that, that we would not expand NATO eastward. That was in 1986, his meeting with Gorbachev. George Herbert Walker Bush, who I think is a traitor and a rotten person, he signed an agreement with the Russians after the collapse of the Soviet Union for no eastward expansion of NATO. Clinton signed it. Even George W. Bush signed it. And now Obama is violating what has been a consensus of Republicans and Democrats, including people like Brent Scowcroft and James Baker III, who were Republicans, Obama is going against that, putting us on the verge of a war with Russia. That's what we're talking about when we talk about this break with the uh, consensus on U.S. foreign policy. You know, Reagan had no love of the Russians. He didn't trust them, but he said, let's deal with them. And even Bush said that about Putin. So what we're dealing with now is an administration which is hell-bent on a war. And I'll tell you one thing, if you know anything about Obama's ability to be a commander, this is the last person you want being the commander-in-chief during a war. Yeah, yeah, the, uh, the joker-in-chief. I mean, really... He just uh, wants to know how he looks. He, he smiles, you know, that's why it was in days after his inauguration, his first inauguration, 
he got the Nobel Peace Prize, and a youngster basically responded and said he must have got the Nobel Peace Prize for his big smile. Well, you know, the, the, the person who can smile at you while he's stabbing you in the back, you know, I spoke at a, a significant Hispanic uh, organization's lunch the other day, and they objected when I first said Obama must be impeached. And then I said, well, Obama's talked nice to you. He said he's going to give you the DREAM Act. He's going to help you out. But what's the reality? Obama has deported more Mexicans than any of the presidents combined, including more than Bush and Clinton did together. Right. Obama sent two million under the argument that they're felons because if someone crosses the border, uh, they're now con- that's now considered a felony. Now... So Obama, who's going to the Hispanics saying, oh, you should vote Democrats, we love you, we want you in the Democratic tent, is the guy who's known in the Hispanic population as the deporter-in-chief. Right. So yeah, he and has, he'll say one thing and, and, and do the exact opposite. Yeah, he'll say something and do the opposite. Of course, he was a male prostitute, so it doesn't surprise me that he'll lie to, through his teeth. Uh, well, look what he anything. said at Fort Hood <clears throat> last week. He went there and talked about his grief at the shootings and how we have to make sure these bases are safe. Well, if he wants them safe, we ought to start funding the programs that are needed for mental health care for veterans, as well as physical care for veterans, which he doesn't do. The two sides are, number one, these veterans are being deployed too many times and need mental health. And the second side is, why is it a gun-free zone on a military base? Well, it's completely insane. But then after Obama does that, what does he do? He goes and gives a speech on income inequality and overcoming it at a billionaire's house in Houston where people have to pay $36,500 to attend the roundtable discussion with Obama on overcoming income inequality. If he wanted to overcome income inequality, he should have taken the $2.5 billion raised and give it to a homeless shelter or to a food bank that's running out of food. Instead of putting yeah. it in the Democratic Party coffers. It, it, I guess his, uh, his regime resembles more every day the Mad Hatter's Tea Party. It resembles a deranged Roman emperor. Yeah, exactly. I don't see him uh, yet making one of his horses or dogs at his home a, a senator, though, but he's, I'm sure there's something up his sleeve that will be quite shocking. Back in a moment. And uh, Harley, the situation I think is pretty dire. We had the blood moon, of course, uh, yesterday. Um, if you are on the East Coast, it was actually on Monday night, starting around 11-ish. And then uh, on the on the East Coast, it was actually on Tuesday, early, early in the morning. What I see happening is we've had lots, uh, we have lots of issues that are going on that are what I call calling for action. Uh, and they need to contact you in order to, this is the, as you said before, impeachment central uh, eight eight hundred nine two 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 nine zero seven. 922 It's the number to call to get more information because if we don't impeach Obama, if we don't stop his current march toward deploying troops in, in uh, Ukraine for so-called nailed NATO exercises, or as they're already doing, uh, they're encouraging the Kiev government to go ahead and use airplanes and tanks against civilian populations just because they're trying to break away and they want to move toward Russia. Uh, What we have is a situation that's extremely volatile, and I think it's likely to be used as an excuse as to why the economy crashed, because they're going to crash it. Uh, And the globalist bankers figure the only way they can kind of get themselves out of their trouble is to go to war, which is not necessary, number one. And number two, it's not survivable. This will not be contained by just a local local uh, conflagration. It will, number one, close off the Strait of Hormuz and the uh, golfed in terms of oil, but it also crashed the world economy to the point where we could have up to a third of the population of the planet in the next several years die from starvation and violence and radioactivity. So I don't think people are aware of just how bad this could get, and even a regional conflict that could attack Iran would precipitate an India-Pakistani exchange because of the narrow two-minute warning before launch on command sequence which guarantees that we're going to have a nuclear winter as <clears throat> we're already heading into an ice age, according to Dr. Easterbrook and Dr. Havabilo Adamazitov from the Russian Space Agency, uh, Dr. Easterbrook in Washington State. And there are m- many, many other scientists that have proven this, that we're actually formally in 2014 heading into the actual 
cusp of at least a monitor type mini ice age. Uh, these happen every 360 years. This cooling period is going to last for 70 years. And it's uh, along with our other issues, we're in a catastrophe right now. We don't need anything else. Um, the economy is in depression. They try to keep on saying it's recession, but the negative growth is there. And the other issue I want you to address, Carly, is the, the, the European bankers tied to this scheme of bailing in is already talking about almost immediately going to what's called negative interest, so your money contracts literally every day you leave it in the bank. Well, it's also negative interest is the banks get paid to take money from the central bank. Right. So the banks get paid and we all get screwed. And then, of course, the nations are left with the debt. Uh, right. There's a man named William White, who's a former chief economist for the um, Bank for International Settlements, which itself is a bad agency, but he's a pretty good economist. I, I know him a bit. And he gave an interview the other day, and he talked about what he calls evergreening. That is the process of keeping bad paper on the books of banks at the face value as opposed to having it be written down to its actual market value. And what he said is that this was the policy leading into September 2008, where the leverage rose to anywhere from 25 to 1 to 35 to 1. Lehman was about $35 in debt for, in bad paper for every supposedly liquid asset they had. And in the book, Too Big to Fail, there's a very famous sequence where all of a sudden the head of Lehman, uh, Richard Fold, was told that Morgan Stanley wasn't going to buy his financial paper anymore. And he said, why not? And they said, well, we all know that it's not worth a damn. And so Fold said, so now I'm the schmuck, meaning you're going to stick me with this when all the rest of you are doing the same thing? And John Mack from Morgan Stanley hung up the phone. And within 24 hours, Lehman was a basket case, and Merrill Lynch was next on the list, and that's when the bailout took place. Right. Now, what William White is saying is that instead of writing down that bad debt, which could, if you had done it over five years, it'd be mostly written off the books right now. And the banks would be solvent and liquid and able to loan money. But the speculators would have taken a gigantic loss. Instead, the speculators have been allowed to keep buying and selling that bad paper because it's backed up by quantitative easing, by Federal Reserve purchases, and now they're saying it's going to be backed up by the ability of those banks to take your deposits. That's what the bail-in is. So the negative interest rates, uh, these are they're, what they're trying to do is avoid what they call deflation. And they're saying there's deflation because consumerism is, is dropping. Well, there's a reason for it. People don't have money. Unemployment rates are up all over the world. Of the people who are, are in, still employed, many of them are employed at lower wages, shorter hours than they were previously. So unless you're a, a billionaire speculator who can buy a yacht and uh, three new houses and, and uh, uh new set of breasts for your wife. You know, that's the spending that's going on. For most people, the prices are going up and the ability to buy things has dropped. And so that's where this idea of negative interest rates and, and giving banks money to borrow money, uh, it's an upside-down world. And instead of admitting that the free trade deregulated model of post-1971 is done, it's dead, and should be shut down. They're trying to keep a model that doesn't work and kill the patients. And, and that's why LaRouche says we're dealing with a bunch of genocidal maniacs in, among the bankers, and they selected Barack Hussein Obama to preside over this destruction, final destruction of the United States. Now, that's why the impeachment is so essential. Obama will not lift a finger to change this because he's owned by the people who are benefiting from it. And that's the reality of the situation. Now, to go back to what you said earlier, we are leading a drive for impeachment. The, the latest on this 
is that you remember we talked two weeks ago about Dianne Feinstein uh, blowing up over the CIA efforts to intimidate the Senate Intelligence Committee staff into not releasing the documents of CIA torture. So Feinstein and the Senate Committee voted to declassify the report to release it. But before they can release it, it has to be checked to make sure there's not important material that should remain classified that's in it. Now, ordinarily, you would have either a committee including the Senate and maybe the White House that would do that. But Feinstein said Obama should personally oversee it. Obama said, no, he's going to give it to John Brennan to oversee. Now, Brennan was the top collaborator with Dick Cheney in implementing the torture policy. He's remained the top controller of strategic and military affairs under Obama. He's the one who brilliantly decided we should side with the jihadists in Libya and Syria. He's the one who's a virtual Saudi agent who had Barack Obama go to Saudi Arabia and kiss the rear end of the 99% dead king of Saudi Arabia. So this is where you see the problem. And then the same Brennan who's doing that was the one who was sent to Kiev to give the orders to the Ukrainian government to crush the resistance in eastern Ukraine. So it's an illegal, unconstitutional government under Obama. And the only question is, who's going to tell the emperor that he's naked? Who's going to tell the population we have to get rid of this guy? Don't wait for the Congress. We have to, the reason I say this is impeachment central is that we're organizing this fight. This is what Keisha's campaign is about, Keisha Rogers. Unbelievable, isn't it? Yeah, Harley, sorry, we got uh, somehow disconnected. Something happened in our end of the line here for a few seconds there. Um, well, uh, you know, on this question of Obama as the worst president, I don't think there's any question about it. And I think the question that now is posed, that I would pose to people of the Democratic Party, is do you want to see the Democratic Party destroy itself by clinging to Obama all the way to the bottom of the ocean? Well, they are. The, they're doing that. Well, they're, they're doing that, and there are two problems with it. One is... It's not good for the health of the party, but I really don't care about the health of the Democratic Party. I'm concerned with the nation. But the problem is, if you don't have a Democratic Party which stands for something, then you're going to get Republicans who will dominate, and the Republicans are just as bad or worse in terms of being controlled by Wall Street. Because both parties reject the idea of the American economic system, of Hamilton, right. But the they just reject it in different ways. They just reject it in different ways, but it's the same end result. Yeah, and the biggest problem here is that what passes for economics is drivel. You know, when people say things like, less government is better, well, that's a very broad statement. You do need government to do certain things. You might as well make sure they do them properly. Or when people say the way to get a balanced budget is to cut spending. Well, the more you cut spending, you find the less your income is going to be. Yeah, you because have to invest. Because there's a, a relationship. It's like, it's like what LaRouche talks about building the infrastructure. You're building something that will generate real economy. Well, and the way to, to really understand this is that you, you have a fool like Phil Graham, who passed as an intelligent figure for the Republican Party. Graham said, the government must live like a family. A family never spends more than it takes in. Well, what's a mortgage? Right. Yeah, what, what is in the old law? days, you take out a mortgage for a house, maybe it's an $80,000 house. You can't have the cash for it, but you take it out because you know that your family will be more secure, more stable, your children will have a better environment than if you're living in a tenement somewhere. And right. so you go into debt. But the idea is you go into debt with a means to pay that debt. So the problem that Graham makes when he says government must be like a family is that he's a liar because he knows better. Phil Graham had debt from the government. He went to college on a government scholarship. He taught at a state university, which meant the government paid him. So here's a guy attacking the hand that fed him. Right. Now, the, the other part of this is that... You, the way you get out of a budget crisis 
is you produce more than you need to consume. And the only way to do that is through scientific and technological progress, through improvements in energy efficiency. Uh, we're going the other direction, solar, wind, biomass. These are much less uh, uh, efficient methods of producing energy. You also do it through increasing the productive powers of labor through technology, through machine tool development. This is the whole history of the advances in the United States uh, is based on this. And this was done through Hamiltonian economic policy, where credit was given a favorable push to invest in those kinds of productive industries as opposed to speculation. Now, that didn't mean the government gave the money. It meant that there were laws on on tax policy, on investment policy, that made it so that a a company that's got old plant and equipment can amortize some of that debt and in the meantime borrow to modernize, knowing that the improvements in efficiency will enable them to not only pay the old debt, but make a profit. If you take that away and say, wherever you can get the highest rate of return, that's what's good for the country, you create a speculative casino. Well, yeah, you're making a funny money that basically is uh, is not a real economy, and it doesn't well, generate I mean, real goods and services. And the only way to cover that is going to be to continue to create bigger and, and bigger bubbles, and at the same time, take it out of the hide of your population. You know, the idea of high wages being bad is crazy. The, the yeah. better the wages people get... The more secure they are, the more productive they'll be, and also the more they'll buy, the more they'll consume. For example, instead of putting it into the speculative economy, if they were to make a not just a government but a national minimum wage, uh, and then the government would then invest the money, literally, which is infrastructure and people, the same thing with with student loans. Why are we making students have to pay anything other than 0% interest back to pay their student loans and why don't we, because what it also inflates the cost of education when you have these student loans, uh, the way they're structured now in the past, uh, and it, it gets a giant burden on young people so they can never buy a home or a car, which is part of the economy. Well, why so, does it cost $50,000 to go to a state university right now? For, it, doesn't, it doesn't make sense, does it? No, and what we're seeing is a destruction of the real value in our country. The, the greatest asset we ever had in this country was the creative potential of the American people. And this is what is unleashed with a Hamiltonian credit system. Whether it's building dams, whether it's building nuclear power plants of the the most advanced types, whether it's the space program, whether it's medical research and technology, uh, computers came came out of this kind of, uh, largely through NASA and certain areas in defense spending that were done by government. You know, Bill Gates and others just profited from work that was done by others. So right. Bill Gates is the billionaire, and meanwhile, the people who made the discoveries and who need to do more to discover things are, are left out with, with no, research, no resources because of the credit crunch. So you know, we've lost this morality of production that used to define the American people. And so you have a large segment of our population which doesn't work. Now, in some cases with older people, it's they've been retired because their wage structures were higher. And in order to get lower wages, you fire the people over 50 and, and uh, not rehire. You let attrition take place. But then with younger people, most of them don't have any skills. They don't have much in the way of hope. They, they don't have job training. They don't have openings, apprenticeships, and things like that because we're shutting down our physical production. So what we're ending up with is an economy which is many-fold multiples of the wolf on Wall Street. And if anyone's seen that picture, that movie, you know, you should know, that's what our economy is. Swindlers betting on pieces of paper to make short-term profits at the expense of the future. And they don't care about it because many of them are on drugs. Right. In other words, these people are addicted to just the idea of speculating on money and physical drugs that make them believe in an alternative reality that doesn't exist. And they think they're gods of Olympus because they make a lot of money. You know, a guy who becomes a billionaire in a, in a Twitter swindle, uh, you know, what does Twitter produce? 
Nothing. There's nothing produced by Twitter except a lot of idiotic babble. Yeah, it's amazing, isn't it? There's something, and in this fact, is what happened to report. our country, and Obama is the, the, pic, the, uh, the uh, picture of it. He's a quintessential four-dimensional tweet. How's that? Well, I'd agree with that, except I don't know if he's even four-dimensional. <laughs> Yeah, well, he's sort of one-dimensional. He, he, he's a one-dimensional intellect, that's for certain. Yeah, uh, it's amazing. Yeah. He is a most definitely a willing puppet by Geppetto Soros, I call it. Well, and and also the Queen of England. And look, we're running out of time to deal with this guy. Uh, the, the, we should not wait until November 2014 or November 2016, because he is, as you said before. He's pushing us on an alternate timetable, which is the timetable of the expected blowout of the financial system, which isn't going to wait till November 2014. Well, and we therefore, the Obama's going for a war before then. We have the Baltic Dry Index. We have the uh, Ukrainian government, the illegitimate government, attacking eastern cities, which is probably within 30 days, if this isn't diffused, going to start a Russian response. We have, you know, it's not many months, and we're going to be back into winter again. And the German economy can't withstand the fact that the Russians, if they're pushed hard enough, they will switch off the gas. And we cannot respond by getting tankers to bring LNG across the Atlantic Ocean uh, to supply Germany if the Russians shut it off. So, well, look, people, basic- call my office. Get involved in this fight. Call my office at 800-922-2907. That's Impeachment Central, and get involved with us. Absolutely, Impeachment Central. 800-922-2907. Thank you, Harley. This is an amazing and timely period that if we don't respond now, we're going to regret it because we don't have time even before the midterm elections this summer. Uh, We need to move very quickly to remove Obama from anywhere near the nuclear football or policy that pushes this forward to force the Russians' hand, and we don't, they are begging us not to do it. That's what we're dealing with. Take care, everybody. We'll be back in a moment with hour number two, hour three.